Loving God, loving each other, loving the lost. Would you pray with me? And uh, don't forget, that's your little bulletin insert. Because we love the lost, we're going to give generously and sacrificially to see them reached. Would you pray with me? Lord, we do love you. And we love each other. And I just ask, Lord, that you would give us a more passionate love for you, for others, for our brothers and sisters in Christ in this room, all across the world. Lord, may we truly, fervently love one another because we love you and because you give us the ability to love others. And Lord, may we uh, give sacrificially this year through this Lottie Moon offering that we'll be concentrating on the next few weeks. Lord, that, that millions and millions and millions of people who do not know you Indeed, billions of people who have never even heard of you may know that Jesus loves them. God, I pray that you would put your hand on our service. Have your will in this place. In Christ's name we pray. Amen. Well, I wonder if you and your family uh, celebrated the big day this week, Monday night. Don't raise your hand. October 31st is the day that we should celebrate the Reformation. October 31st is when Martin Luther pinned up those 95 theses. And if you know much about Martin Luther, you know that his big quote right from the word, the just shall live by faith. And we have been talking about faith the last few weeks. And it's appropriate that that subject should be so fresh on our minds. But let's face it, most of us don't think of October 31st for that. Maybe we should. Faith. We talked a few weeks ago about the two kinds of faith. Circumstantial faith versus eternal faith. Circumstantial faith comes and goes. Circumstantial faith is built on feelings and and happenstance in a person's life. It's built on shifting sand. It won't stand the test of time, will it? Eternal faith, on the other hand, authentic faith, is built on the promises of God's unchanging word. God's will, God's word, never changes. He's immutable. He never changes. He's reliable. He's trustworthy. He, is, he can be trusted. He will do all he promised to do. And this morning, we want to finish what we started last week. We, we got through four of the, the principles found in Proverbs chapter 3. If you want to turn there to Proverbs chapter 3, this passage teaches us that abundant living is possible through authentic faith. So, if abundant living is impossible without authentic faith, it is therefore crucial that we build, that we develop authentic faith. We need it now more than ever, don't we? But there are faith killers, aren't there? Each and every day. Today, I've already experienced it. I bet most of us this week have had our faith at least questioned, tested, There are things that destroy our faith. There are things that kill our faith. And as as followers of Christ, we should be trying to develop our faith. There are circumstances. There are things out of our control, some things within our control that come in and kill our faith. What are they? Well, there's there's probably countless. Let me me offer a few before we finish these these last few principles. Here's some faith killers. Self-sufficiency is a faith killer, isn't it? I can take care of myself. I know what's best for me. I got it under control. I don't need your help. Anybody here, the Lord, I don't need you. Self-sufficiency. Pride is a faith killer. Doubt. Fear. Disobedience. When we do things our way, walking away from the Lord, it kills our faith. When we decide we know what's best when it comes to our marriage, we know what's best when it comes to our family, we know what's best when it comes to how we spend our money, where we go, where we don't go. I know what's best for me, because I'm self-sufficient, I'm prideful, I'm afraid to give up control, I doubt that God even exists anyway, then we become disobedient. It kills your faith, doing things our way. Dishonesty is a faith killer. Small-mindedness is a faith killer. We sometimes use that phrase, putting God in a box. God can do this, but he's not allowed to do any more. I mean, what if God really showed up this morning? What would happen? What would it look like? Would he be welcome? I think he would. I hope to think he would. But small-mindedness, not really believing that God can do what he says he can do. Traditionalism is a faith killer. Now, notice I didn't say traditions. 
or being traditional. Nothing wrong with that. But traditionalism says, we've always done it that way, we're not changing for anybody. I don't even care if it's in the Bible. Traditionalism. All about what we've done in the past. All about the way God worked in the past. The Bible says it's a new day. God is doing a new thing. We have to start new traditions. We need to be willing to break out of tradition. Prejudice is a faith killer. Dead religion is a faith killer. Religion built on works and performance and customs and, and, and rituals. It's a faith killer. Can you imagine there are people going to church all over this, this land, churches that don't preach the Bible, churches that do not even believe the Bible is God's inspired word? Why would they waste their time? I mean, really. Go have fun. Go play golf. Swim. Something. Don't waste your time with the Bible if you don't believe it's God's word. If it's just another idea on how to live your life, dead religion based on man's ideas, man's traditions, man's, view, man's views on how to get to heaven, complacency from Christian people is a faith killer. Complacency, apathy towards the word of God, towards the things of God, being apathetic. Do you remember last year when we did the Purpose Driven Life? It's about, about a year ago that we finished that up, wasn't it? And we learned that life is all about five purposes. Evangelism, worship, fellowship, discipleship, and ministry. Our church is, is built on those five purposes. Our lives should be built on those five purposes. But you know what? Christians sometimes could care less about telling anybody about Jesus, could care less about serving anybody but themselves, could care less about getting together and fellowshipping with other Christians. They don't think they need it. Discipleship, ah. Man, we need to be a church that's focused on discipling people. We've had quite a few people go through the waters of baptism in the last few weeks. We need to disciple them. We need to be passionate about it. Ministry. All of it. These should be things that drive us, that, that burn within our heart. And the truth is, a lot of Christians are very, very complacent about it. And, and the faith killer, probably worse than any of them, irreverence. Irreverence towards the things of God. Irreverence towards His Word. When you, when you watch sitcoms, most sitcoms on television are just very irreverent. Most of them, not all, but the vast majority. Many movies, comedies, the, the, the language we use sometimes, it's irreverent. It's blasphemous. And you know, adults allow this in their homes. They expose their children to it in churches just like ours. Just a complete irreverence towards God. A, a complete irreverence towards God's name. These are things that kill faith. These are things, Dad, Mom, that will kill your little, your, little, your little boy, your little girl's faith when they see you laughing at some profane comedian that's making fun of God and making fun of God's Word. So those are some faith killers. And we, and we talked about faith. What is faith? Well, we gave a big, long definition for it last week. How about the short version? Putting your trust in Christ. Putting your trust in something. As Christians, we put our faith in God. You remember that old hymn, Trust and Obey? For there's no other way to be happy in Jesus but to trust and obey. When we walk with the Lord in the light of His Word, what a glory He sheds on our way. While we do His good will, He abides with us still and with all who will trust and obey. We talked about last week how obedience and faith are the highway to health and strength. Obedience and faith go hand in hand. Just read the book of James. It's not just saying, I believe in doing whatever you want. Our, our, our lives prove whether or not we have a relationship with Christ. Listen to verse 2 of that hymn. Not a shadow can rise, not a cloud in the sky, but his smile quickly drives it away. Not a doubt nor fear, not a sigh nor tear can abide while we trust and obey. And we, and we read last week, we, we looked at Proverbs 3, 1 through 8. We read those verses, but we focused on verse 5 and 6. Trust in the Lord with all your heart and lean not on your own understanding. In all your ways, acknowledge him, and he will direct your path, or he will make your path straight. He will smooth out your path in front of you. Do not be wise in your own eyes. Fear the Lord and depart from evil, or shun evil. It will be strength to your flesh and health to your bones. That's what we're going to look at this morning. God's reward to people who put their faith and trust in him. Faith sees the invisible, believes the incredible, and receives the impossible. Spurgeon said that, that a little faith will bring your soul to heaven. A great faith will bring heaven to your soul. Abraham Lincoln said, faith in God is indispensable to successful statesmanship. That president, he knew he couldn't make it a day without his faith. 
It's his faith that drove him. It's his faith that separated him from the rest. So today, let's talk about faith. Let's talk about developing authentic faith. Last week, we talked about the first four principles. Principle number one, trust in Christ completely. If you want to develop faith, if you want to develop authentic faith, it starts by getting saved. Trust in Christ as Savior. But isn't it so much more than that? When, when, when it says trust in the Lord with all your heart, that's so much more than just getting saved. That sustains every Christian throughout his life. Trusting the Lord in every single critical area of your life. Trusting Him more than you trust principle number two, your feelings. Doubt your feelings, not God's Word. I mean, really. What can we rely on? Our feelings or God's promises? We choose to trust God's promises. We're going to look at all brand new promises that we didn't even talk about last week. There's so many. There are countless promises. How God wants to bless our lives. Trust Christ completely. Doubt our feelings. Principle number three, acknowledge his lordship. Remember, if he's not Lord of all, he's not Lord at all. He's our Lord. He's our master. He's the one who calls the shots. He's in charge. Principle number four, Principle number four, follow his direction. (laughs) Follow his direction. And and we talked about you can't trust people's directions all the time. You can always trust his direction. He will never, ever steer us wrong. Are we willing to follow his way of accomplishing what we all ultimately want? We all want health. We all want strength. We all want joy. I don't know a person in the world that wants to be miserable, but I know an awful lot of people, including a lot of Christians, who are unwilling to take God's prescription and accept it and follow it and apply it. They think they know better. And that brings us to principle number five. And that is we must distrust our own wisdom. Distrust your wisdom. Verse number seven says, do not be wise in your own eyes. We've got to distrust, distrust our, own, our own wisdom. You know, there's a difference between humanly wisdom and heavenly wisdom, isn't there? Remember in Romans 1.22 where it says, professing themselves to be wise, they became fools. Fool. You know, I've met a lot of really smart people that had no acknowledgement of Christ in their lives. The Bible calls them fools. They may have a master's degree, a doctor's degree, two or three doctor's degrees. The person who will not acknowledge Christ who trusts his own brains over the wisdom of the Lord, the Bible calls a fool. True wisdom is built on authentic faith that says, God knows what's best for me. Do you believe that this morning? God knows what's best for me, my family, my career, my life. In fact, it's his life. And it is true that the child of God should be growing in wisdom each and every day. But, but the person that becomes wise, the person, it's kind of like when you go to high school. Boy, you think you got it. You think you know it. Then you go to college and realize, oh, man, I don't know anything. Then you get out of college, you think you know something. And so you start working on your master's work. Then you realize you really didn't know all that much. The smarter we get, the more we realize, man, I just don't know very much. And we live in, a, in, in, in the information age where, I mean, technology and information is at, at the click of a computer. It's all around us. People are, are brilliant. But what it should really show us is how little we know. The closer you get to the omniscient God, the God who knows everything, he's all wise, we should realize, man, I can't trust my wisdom. I'm going to, I'm going to, no way do I trust my wisdom. I don't know enough. You know, it may seem really smart to cut a corner at work. Nobody's going to find out. Nobody's going to know. Just cut that corner. The the, the boss man isn't going to find out. It's not going to affect anybody anytime soon, maybe down the road, but who cares? Just cut that corner. It may seem really smart today on your way out of here when somebody cuts you off, and let's face it, someone inevitably will, hopefully by the outside of the church parking lot on Route 1 or something. But it might seem real smart to cut them off back or to give some hand gesture or yell some out the window or honk your horn, give them a dirty look. Is that really the wise thing to do? You know, um, it may seem real smart today when you go to a restaurant. Some of us will go to restaurants today. And let's say uh, your, your server just doesn't quite get that food to you fast enough. It doesn't bring you the right drink or, or pours coffee in your sweet tea or something. I don't know. Messes up on your order. It may seem real smart to you to really let them have it. Or to step up. I'll show him a lesson. Of course, you're in your Sunday best. They know where you were. Is that really a smart thing to do? Is it really the wise thing to do? I think not. 
you know, somebody thought it would be a really good idea back in the 80s to, um, to create New Coke. Y'all remember New Coke? 1985-ish, I think. It was terrible. It was a complete failure. Almost took the cook and call the people under. New Coke, New Coke was a bad idea, wasn't it? So at some point, somebody thought it would be a really good idea to, um, to trade Babe Ruth. I think from the Red Sox to the Yankees. In fact, I think he might have started with the Orioles. Some genius thought, man, let's trade Babe Ruth. He's not worth keeping. We can't trust Aaron Wilson Campbell. Somebody thought it would be a really good idea to invent the necktie. What were they thinking? We can't trust our own ideas. We need, to, we need to take our wisdom. If God makes us wise and we follow his wisdom, that's great. But we cannot trust our opinion, our discretion, our answers for everything. We are not trustworthy. Compared to principle number six, revere God's wisdom. Distrust your wisdom, revere God's wisdom. It says, fear the Lord and depart from evil. Proverbs 1 7 says that the fear of the Lord is the beginning of knowledge. That's where true wisdom is. Fearing God. And nobody wants to talk about fearing God anymore. We want to make him our big buddy. Our big buddy in the sky. God, my big buddy. You know what? That's nowhere in Scripture. He's not your big buddy. He's God. He created the heavens and the earth. He's all powerful. He's all knowing. He's trustworthy. And he's to be treated with tremendous respect and reverence. We need to be very, very careful how we use the name of God. And we need to revere his wisdom. He knows the beginning from the end. He knows everything. Why would we not check in with him? Why would we not acknowledge him? as we're told to do in verse 6. We should revere his wisdom, fearing him. And we want to water that down. Almost every sermon I ever hear on fearing God wants to water it down. You know what? Forget it. We need to fear him. He's God. He could crush you like a grape if he wanted to. He's, a, he's an awesome God. He's a jealous God. He knows everything. And he still loves you. Isn't that great? He knows you. Inside and out, and he still loves you. And he knows what's best for you. He knows, and when he sees time, he doesn't see yesterday and tomorrow. It's all on one plane. He's not bound by time. He's in complete control. A radio announcer once asked Leo DeRocher, the manager of the baseball New York Giants, you know, over here, there were a, was a baseball New York Giants at one time, and he asked him this question. He said, um, barring the unforeseen, will your club win, win the pennant? And uh, the manager replied, there ain't going to be no one for seeing. He wasn't, he wasn't even going to allow for that. He thought he was in complete control. He's just a man. He really wasn't. With God, there is no one for seeing. Every single circumstance that comes in your life has to go through your loving Heavenly Father. He deserves our trust because He's sovereign. He's the God of gods, the King of kings. So if there is a higher source for wisdom... Should we not revere him? I mean, there's people that don't believe that there's a higher source for wisdom. But if there is, let's go out on a limb and say, if there is a higher source for wisdom, should we not revere him? Should we not trust him? And, you know, and if that source is the sovereign judge of the nations, should we not consult with him? Should we not fear him? Have you ever stood before a judge? I have. And I was shaking in my boots. Traffic violation, by the way. Nothing major. I was, boy, it's a scary thing to stand before a judge, isn't it? One day, each and every one of us are going to stand before the judge of the nations, the God of God, the King of kings. And those who refuse to revere the Lord will stand before him condemned. That should get our attention. That should make us want to dig a little bit deeper when it comes to Lottie Moon. These people are going to stand before the Lord condemned. They never even heard his name. They're going to stand before the Lord condemned. That doesn't sound fair, does it? Every knee will bow and every tongue will confess, but it will be too late for him. It will be too late for her. The person that enjoys evil today is going to pay a terrible price tomorrow. Isn't that true? I mean, we know that just in in the economics of life. Uh, Getting AIDS is a terrible thing. Getting put in jail is a terrible thing. Losing your reputation and looking and completely losing credibility in your community. It's a terrible thing. You become addicted to something. Man, 
It just overwhelms you and it controls your life and it can ruin your life. But you know, every one of those things in the big picture, they're short term. The worst thing that could happen to you on this planet is short term. Hell is forever. It's forever and ever and ever. And we don't talk about it very much, do we? We don't want to think about how terrible hell is. Those that refuse to just bend their knee and to revere him for who he is, that's their destiny. That's their future. That's a reality. We should think about that a little bit more often, shouldn't we? And you know what? I think we need a healthy dose of the fear of God in our church, in this nation, revering God for who he is. So, do you want to develop an authentic faith? You have to trust Christ completely. You have to get saved. And as a Christian, you're going to have to continue to trust him. When, when there's more bills going out than there's money coming in, we trust him completely. We, we doubt our feelings, not God's promises. God's promises are forever. We acknowledge his lordship. We follow his directions. He says go left, we go left. He says right, we go right. We just do what he asks us to do. We distrust our own wisdom. We revere his wisdom because he's God. He's sovereign judge of all. Principle number seven. Receive God's blessings. Receive God's blessings. Look at verse number 8. If you're willing to trust Christ completely, doubt your feelings, acknowledge his lordship, follow his directions, distrust your wisdom and revere his wisdom, it will bring health to your flesh and strength to your bones. Your, your translation might say nourishment to your bones. It's good for you. It just makes common sense, doesn't it? I mean, uh, what do they call it? At-risk living? All those at-risk behaviors? We don't need to go through the list, do we? Those at-risk behaviors shorten your life. It's, it's just a statistical fact. People are dying young because they're engaging in at-risk behaviors. Does anybody in here, like me, take a multivitamin? My mother tells me they're garbage. They, just, they don't do anything for you. But I take one. i got a, a, a nutritionist friend who works for Tony's Vitamins down in Chattanooga. And uh, the other day I found a whole big bottle of vitamins, so I started taking vitamins again. Why on earth do we do that? I mean, those things smell. They're nasty. You can taste them the rest of the day sometimes. And it's like swallowing a cell phone. It's terrible. I hate taking those vitamins. I took one this morning. Why do we take vitamins? Why do we do that? Well, we, I, I'm assuming in my case, and I'm sure in yours, for long-term benefits. There's long-term benefits associated with taking care of your body with getting those vitamins that you can't get for yourself. Well, these principles are, are, give us long-term, when we apply these principles to our lives, we can receive blessings in the long term. And why are we so afraid of that? Why are we so afraid to claim God's promises, to, to claim what our Heavenly Father has promised us? We should humbly claim every single blessing that He's offered us. Imagine if our church did that. Imagine if you did that in your family, how different things could be. What are some of God's promises? Well, here's a few more to think about. You know, God promises health in this passage. It will bring flesh, it will bring health to your flesh and body and strength or nourishment to your bones. In other words, compliance with God's will is therapeutic. It's good for you. This healing is first and foremost spiritual healing, by the way. Scripture often uses the physical body to illustrate what God's doing in the spiritual realm. God can and will heal you physically, but this isn't promising you to live to be 150 with no problems. Jesus chose to heal some people, but I got bad news for you. Every single one of them died eventually. He healed them, praise God, he physically healed them in the short term, but was what is much, much more important is the long term, spiritual health, spiritual wellness. And, and by the way, I know some good Christian folks. I, I learned of a good godly, wonderful Christian sister this week who is diagnosed with breast cancer. You know what? I'm praying for her. I believe God can and will heal her. But good people get sick. Good people die. People that love Jesus. So we can't be so attached to the physical realm that we forget, man, there's a much bigger picture here. Spiritual healing is eternal. In this passage, there's an admonition. What's the admonition? Be faithful. Develop faith. But with that admonition comes a promise of health and strength. What are some other promises in Scripture? Turn to Psalm 118. I read this in my quiet time this morning. I just felt like I had to share it with you. Psalm 118. 
God promises us his favor. These verses will blow your mind. You cannot read this casually. Look at what it says in Psalm 118, starting in verse 5. David says, I call on the Lord in distress. Are you stressed out this morning? Is there some stress in your life? I can tell you, I've got some stress. I really do. I bet most of you do too. Things in your life you can't control, things in your life that are bothering you, things in your life that have got you down, call out to the Lord in, in distress. And the Lord answered me and set me in a broad place. It goes on to say in verse 6, I want you to see this with your own eyes if possible. The Lord is on my side. Isn't that awesome? Isn't that refreshing? God's on our side. I will not fear what man can do to me. The Lord is for me among those who help me. Therefore, I shall see my desire on those who hate me. It is better to trust in the Lord than to put confidence in man. It is better to trust in the Lord than to put confidence in princes. In other words, we don't trust each each other completely. We don't put our confidence in, in, in people. We don't put our confidence in the government. We put our confidence in the Lord Jesus Christ because he favors us. That's a promise from God. He favors you. He promises you wisdom in James 1, 5. He promises you food and clothing in Matthew 6. And it may not be sex that's happening. It may be just food and clothing. But he promised he'd take care of us. He promised us a personal relationship with him for the asking in John 1.12. He promised our family blessings. Every man in this room should write down Psalm 128. Read it tonight. Psalm 128, family blessings. Blessed is the man that fears the Lord and walks in his way. He's going to bless you. He's going to prosper you. He promised us personal blessings. Read Matthew chapter 5, the Beatitudes. Blessed are the poor in spirit. Blessed are those who hunger and thirst after righteousness. He promised us to be our refuge. A refuge. When things get bad, Psalm 46 1, God is our refuge in strength. He's a very present help in times of trouble. He's our refuge. Do you need a refuge? Run to Jesus. Psalm 119, 165. Write it down. Psalm 119, 165. God promised us peace. But if you read it, it's not just peace, great peace. God promised us great peace. Psalm 119, 165 for those who follow his law. Those are promises from Scripture. We should claim every single one of them. We should make them revolve our life around that. Remember Hebrews 11, 6? God is a rewarder of those who faithfully, faithfully, diligently seek him. Abundant living is dependent on authentic faith. Abundant living is possible with authentic faith. So the question to ask yourself this morning is, do you have authentic faith? Are you developing? Do you want more authentic faith? Do you trust Christ? Have you trusted Christ as your Savior yet? Today may be your day. I can tell you there's nothing will give the heavens more joy in this room right here more joy than for you to come and say, I want to accept Christ as Savior today and to pray and invite Christ into your life. But maybe you're relying on your own ideas, your own abilities to get through. You need, as a Christian, you need to trust Christ completely. Doubt your feelings. Acknowledge his lordship. Is he lord of your life? Are you following his direction? Today we're going to take the Lord's Supper in just a minute. Do you not think it would be wise to spend some time alone with the Lord and contemplate your situation? And if you're living in, in, in absolute rebellion, if you're walking in a total different direction than what he's called you to live, repent, give it to him, do something about it distrusting our wisdom, revering his wisdom. And today I just want to close by asking you, are you receiving God's blessings in your life? Are you receiving all of the blessings that he promised you, that he wants to give you? Are you cashing in on everything that God has laid before you? Or are you just kind of existing? Yeah, I'm saved. But it's kind of a pathetic Christian life, isn't it? Not doing certain things not going certain places, going to church, but not experiencing the abundance that Christ has. What a pitiful situation many Christians find themselves in because they've got one foot in the world and one foot in the church, and you're just miserable. That's a recipe for misery. As a child of God, you should cash in on every single promise, every blessing he has for you by developing authentic faith. It doesn't just happen by saying, hey, Lord, gimme, gimme, gimme. We all know that's not going to work, don't we? It happens by humbling yourself and developing authentic faith. Would you pray with me? In fact, would you stand as we pray?
This morning, the altar is open for anyone who needs to do business with God, requesting baptism, church membership, you want to get saved. Man, that's all, that's all happening. But I want to focus on that child of God who wants more of God's blessing, more of God's favor. You have not been receiving all of God's promises, all of God's blessings in your life. And you're willing to say, as a child of God, I want to cash in on God's promises by, by developing a more authentic faith, a deeper faith. Would you pray with me? Lord God, I just ask that you would have your will and your way in this time of visitation. Lord, I pray that that person who's farthest from you would turn around, step out of their seat, come down this aisle and get the help that they need. Lord, I believe there's people in this room who have yet to do principle one. They have not fully given their heart to you and had their sins forgiven. Lord, may, may they be wise enough to take that step, take that initiative to come and invite you into their lives. The Lord, I also pray for that child of God, that person who's known you for five years, ten years, twenty years, fifty years. It doesn't matter. Lord, your blessings are at, at their disposal for the asking. Lord, I pray that they would do what they need to do, that they would go to you and beg as a child of God that you would develop with them a deeper faith and that you would bless their lives. In Christ's name we pray. Amen. Would you please be seated? God is working in the hearts of men, women, boys, girls, and we praise Him for that. Today we want to conclude our service by partaking of the Lord's Supper. And we also want to praise God for what He's done in Chris's life today. He's sitting up here with Don right now. Chris just prayed to receive Christ into his life. Amen. Let's just praise the Lord for that. Congratulations, Chris. That's wonderful. Why do we observe the Lord's Supper? You may be wondering that as you look at your watch. We observe the Lord's Supper regularly. He said, do this till I come. He didn't tell how often to do it. Didn't tell us exactly how to do it. But, he, but Jesus said, do this till I come in remembrance of of me, remembering what he did on the cross. On a Sunday where we're all busy, we have a lot to do, and we stop and say, you know what, that can wait. We're going to remember our Savior. We're going to give him honor and glory for saving someone's soul this morning, working in individuals' lives, and being our personal Lord and Savior. We come to observe the Lord's Supper given to us in memory of our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. In the First Corinthians 11, on the night Jesus was betrayed, the Lord Jesus, on that same night that he was betrayed, took bread. When he had given thanks, he broke it. Would you pray with me? Lord God, we thank you for all you've done in our lives. Most of all, we thank you for that cross, which we now remember. Thank you for sacrificing your body for us. And so much more, Lord. You, you left heaven to become a man, to live a perfect life, to die on that cross. And we just say thank you. And today, we remember in Christ's name. We pray. <laughs> Thank <laughs> you.